as Randy said, you guys can call me Chris, and I was a newspaper reporter for about 15 years, and that is where I um, learned to, to write, basically. Uh, in high school, of course, there are classes, and in college you take classes to learn how to write, but there are very specific kinds of writing that you do as a journalist, as a newspaper reporter, and so uh, most of what, what I know is kind of filtered through that experience that I had working for a newspaper. So do you guys know what that's kind of like, working for a newspaper? Have yeah. you ever gone to, so what do you think it's like? Are you like the editor of it? I used to be, yes. <coughs> I was a, a managing editor, and that's basically a person who uh, looks at all of the stories that all of the newspaper reporters write and um, make sure that they're grammatically correct and make sure that, uh, that the facts are correct. And um, that way when the newspaper is published, there are no mistakes in there. Uh, as a reporter, you basically go out into the field, um, you have different assignments that you have to cover and that will often be like maybe a town hall meeting or um, something might have happened where the police got involved. So you would have to go and talk to the police and write a story that's based on your interviews. So what you guys are going to be doing in this class is actually really similar to what a newspaper reporter does every day. Um, typically about twice a day, a newspaper reporter is assigned a story. So each of you has uh, a topic, and that's what you're going to write on. Um, so who's doing the mechanic? Okay. And are you Brandon? Brennan. Brennan? Yeah. And what is your topic? Uh, coffee shop. Coffee shop. Okay. So you're Emery, mm -hmm. and you are writing about the teacher who runs the, cop the uh, swim, swim team. Right. Okay. Um, so just the same as you guys have an assignment, uh, when you're a newspaper reporter, you get to work, and typically as things happen throughout the day, you find out that you have to go and write a story about them. So do you guys have any um, specific questions, I guess, kind of before we get started for what you think would be helpful to know as you're writing your stories? Well, they have the direction of questions that I did send you, but they also have their questions in front of them, so they know what they're going to be asking. I don't think they know the answers. Some of them might know some of the answers. Okay, so have any of you actually interviewed your subjects yet? No. No. So when do you do that? Um, we haven't assigned a date yet. Okay. It's going to be in about two weeks, give or take. Gotcha. So I did actually have a chance to look over some of the questions that you guys are going to ask, and I think it sounds like you're you're right on with what you're going to do. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about um, as you're writing a story, as you're actually putting your words together, your thoughts after an interview, sort of what the process is with that and how you can be uh, most effective in communicating a story. Um, have, has any of you ever heard of um, show me, don't tell me? So what do you think that might mean? Show me, don't tell me. Emery? Like, um, like a video, probably. Like, instead of words, it would be like, like a video. Right, so there would be sort of a, a, visual, uh, a visual element of what you were seeing that actually uh, kind of reinforces whatever idea you were trying to to go for, which is a little heady probably for, for a fifth grader, but um, in writing, when somebody says, show me, don't tell me, that means um, there are kinds of two different ways that you can start to tell a story. You can say, um, let's say, she was very angry. That when you read that in a story, you understand that, okay, somebody was very angry. That's sort of telling somebody she was very angry. But what if instead of saying she was very angry, you said her face turned bright red, she balled up her fist, and 
She stormed out of the room, um, slamming the door behind her and then punching the wall. So what is the message that you get from those sentences? Uh, she's infuriated. She's mad. Really mad. Yeah, really mad. She's angry. So that would be an example of showing somebody instead of telling them. So if I just said that she was angry, but I didn't say all of the rest of that, do you still have the same picture of that person? Do you have any picture of that person at all? But what about when I said that she was so angry that she turned bright red and, and stormed out. You know a little bit more. This, yeah. this person obviously has quite a temper. Emery? Doesn't authors, like in kids' books, like tell it, like they tell them instead of showing them? Like they don't say, um, like they balled up the fist and they, they turned bright red. I think um, there's, there are different levels of, of showing and telling, and I think that um, as you get older, you will probably encounter more, um, like, less obvious ways that, um, that writers are trying to communicate. And, and the, the point behind that is that you want to actually get lost in a story, and so if you read a sentence that says she was angry, how much really does that interest you? But if you read that somebody was so angry that she turned bright red and stormed out and, and did those things, um, is that a little bit more interesting? So do you guys understand the difference between showing and telling? Okay. Um, so. Anthony, you have the, the mechanic who is a female. What are some ways, as you're writing your story, that you can kind of show people instead of telling them? So maybe um, one of the things that's really interesting about a woman who's a mechanic is that um, that's not very typical. Yeah. That while boys and girls can do the same things, there aren't as many females as boys who choose to go into one of the questions I had, One of the questions that I was, I was being smart when I wrote the question, I said, how do uh, Pink Pingendales and Car Oil get along? Ah, I was being okay, smart. yeah. So you probably will want to avoid Stereotypes like that, we're but um, I, I did work on everyday basis. So. But I think that actually what you were thinking is interesting because you're saying that you realize that that there um, that there's something unexpected here, yeah. and it's very easy to look at people and to say, okay, this is this type of person, and this is what's expected of this person, and you know, unfortunately, we still live in a day when being a female and being a mechanic are unexpected ideas, even though blue-collar workers are necessary um, and in high demand everywhere. Um, so what are some ways that, um, as you guys are writing your stories, that you can sort of ask your people you're interviewing to give you some details that allow you to sort of show the reader or your audience about this person instead of just telling them? Uh, or what are some details that you can pay attention to? Well, I could show the uh, students making coffee and delivering. I could show the teacher uh, managing students around, like telling them like this is what they need to do at the beginning of class. We have a day on Friday that uh, just we just work on um, other things needed for the company, but we don't sell coffee that day. So uh, we could, like, you know, uh, look at the teacher, uh, talking to the students, stuff like that. So, yeah. So, and by doing that, you're not just, you're not just telling your audience or your readers 
what this teacher does, you're actually showing these are the things that are part of this job, right? Mm -hmm. Emery? Um, maybe she could um, get a, like, a little bit wet, like when students jump off the diving board and they head into the pool, they make it splashed a little bit. That might show um, that she's a swim coat. Okay, yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, no, that's a really, that's a, it's a very visual idea, and you're thinking of really good ways that you can show that um, in a video. So if you were actually writing that in words instead of taking a, a video of it, you would say, uh, what's, what's the teacher's name? Miss Heather. Uh, Miss Heather. Miss Heather. So you would say, uh, Miss Heather's pants never stay dry for very long. Or, you know, that, that um, she <laughs> had splash marks on her pants from, you know, team after team of students jumping into the water. Um, and that way you can say. Because that's perfect. Remember, you're going to be doing a paragraph or so for the portrait that goes up with it. That's like a perfect type of start. So think about that. What she said is great. When, I, when you're talking about the show part, can I see like the tool, like a tool that she's using? Yes. So for, for showing with your mechanic, um, maybe something you would talk about is, is she wearing stained Dickie's pants? Um, are her hands dirty? What are her hands? Typically, anytime you're talking about someone in a trade or any kind of profession, you want to kind of focus on what their hands are doing. Um, a doctor, um, you, anybody who's in a profession where um, they're, they're using their minds a lot, you want to look at their eyes. And what are their eyes actually kind of saying and taking in? Um, about them. You can tell a lot about what's important uh, to a person by just following their eyes and seeing what is it you know, that they're sort of seeking out in the world or what is it that uh, is interesting to them. And typically your eyes sort of follow that. Your eyes follow what is interesting in your surroundings. Right now, I mean, I'm very tempted to look at Randy because he's such an interesting fellow. But uh, you get the idea, Brennan. Oh, no, oh were you just were you just giving him a shout out because mm -hmm. he's super interesting? So, what's the first thing that you should start a story with as you guys are kind of going through this process? A hook. I mean, like something to get, actually get the reader interested in a uh, concept of yours. You don't just want to like make it completely boring and. You want to have a transition at the beginning, so it's not just like jumping right into it. Right. Otherwise, I've You've been doing a good job of telling these guys, you know, how to how to start a story. I see. So, have you written a story before? Where um, have you ever written a short story, or even just a true story for your school newspaper, or anything uh, like that? Not really, but I, I want to make yeah more of a like in making big like big stories that take like a very, very long time to make. Um, so that's more of what I'm interested in. But uh, yeah, I've had to make short stories before. In video or that you wrote? Wrote. Okay. Anthony, do you have much experience with writing stories? So you're here to learn. Okay. I'm more do photography. So. Gotcha. Well, writing is always handy, and I'm not just saying that because it's my job. It actually is really helpful. Emery, have you written a story before? Many times in class, but they're only like, <coughs> like maybe the longest was like an essay, like five paragraphs long. Okay. Five paragraphs can be a lot, depending on how much information you have. So typically, when you're starting a story, you want to kind of think about, OK, well, first, let's, 
see if anybody knows what this is. I'm not very good at drawing straight, just because that's my personality. So what, what is this? Triangle. triangle. Do they know about the triangle? These guys are coming in. It's a field okay. of view. Yeah. So it's actually kind of supposed to be a pyramid, but as I said, I am not a very good uh, artist. But um, you want to take your triangle or your pyramid and turn it upside down. And basically, when you start a story, one, one kind of um, quick tip that you can use is to take all of your biggest ideas and bring them up here. And how you can remember that they go up here is that this is the biggest part of your pyramid. And then it gets smaller as you go down. So think of this as like the start of the story. And as you go through the story, you get down to things that are less and less important. So, so up here are all of the really interesting, the most interesting things that you have. And down here are the things that really, if you need to cut a minute from your video story or if you need to cut several paragraphs from your uh, written story, this is where you chop down here. So. When I was a newspaper editor, sometimes I would get stories um, that said, there was a meeting last night of the York Township Board of Commissioners, and 10 people were in attendance, and the commissioners talked about sewer fees, and um, they talked about zoning rules, and um, halfway through the meeting, a circus came in and the president commissioner hopped on top of an elephant and rode out of the meeting uh, yelling at everybody and saying that he wants to move to Alaska. So, you know a bunch of things about this meeting, but what is the, what is the thing that is most interesting about that whole meeting. The elephant? Yeah, okay. So you're in the middle of a meeting and then here comes, you know, the circus, the circus. elephant. Dude is actually riding out on the elephant and yet the thing that the person chose to start the story with was there was a meeting. So the moral of this story is actually a couple things. First of all, the there was a meeting should sort of be something that you don't even really have to say if you're talking about um, a meeting. People can kind of, do you guys know what the word infer means? Yeah. What does it mean, Emery? Um, to make an edge, like a guess, like th thinking like in the future, like what what will happen? Okay. Like you'll infer you can sort of make a guess. You can sort of infer what happened if you're talking about the fact, you know, if you're talking about this meeting, then it probably happened because you wouldn't really be writing in a newspaper about something that didn't exist, right? So, so the thing that they should have put up at the top here in the lead in the big part of the pyramid would be the elephant, the circus, the fact that somebody ran off and joined the circus during the meeting but instead, there were, you know, these other details. Like, we really, do we care how many people attended the meeting? Do we? That's like a detail that goes where on your pyramid? Closer to the bottom. Yeah, closer to the bottom. And when you're telling a story, if it kind of helps you to think about, like, what's most important, Think about, if you had been at that meeting, what would be the thing that you called to like tell your mom about? Would you, would you like hop on the phone and say, Mom, I was at a meeting and 10 people attended. Or would you say, Mom, I was at a meeting and the circus came in and took away the president commissioner. You know, obviously you would talk about the circus. So, so typically, um, 
when you're starting a story, and especially since all of you are sort of novices or beginners at telling stories, you might actually be helped by kind of writing, you know, visualizing this in your mind and thinking what things go at the top, what things are kind of in the middle, and what things are at the bottom, and um, how you can kind of decide that is what is, you know, what is number one? Like, what really is the most important thing? What's the thing that you would kind of rush home and call and tell somebody about? And anything like that should sort of go to the top. Does that make sense? Does anyone have any questions about that? So things like um, how many people attended the meeting. When you're, say you're writing your story, you kind of chop off the bottom by taking all of these weird little details down here, like how many people attended the meeting, and just kind of sewing them in up at the top or in the middle. So you've had, you had the most adorable quizzical face on you right now. That's very cute. I wonder how often I get that look. I just don't even notice. because. Um, so 10 people attended the meeting. When we're up here and we're writing about what happened, instead of giving the fact that 10 people attended the meeting its own sentence down here later, somewhere up here we could just say that the crowd of 10 people watched in amazement as the president commissioner, uh, you know, was marched people, or, you know, the, the uh, some residents in the crowd of 10 people gasped as Mr. Henry rode away on the giant pachyderm. Um, that is a way that you can kind of put a detail in without having to give it its own sentence. Do you guys understand? Do you follow that? Mm -hmm. Yeah? OK. Uh, I think the most, um, I'm just kind of going to give you guys like some overall general hints about writing or some tips. Uh, the most important thing to sort of consider, uh, well, there are two things, actually. The first is uh, make sure that you proofread. You guys know what proofreading is, mm -hmm. right? So after you have actually written the thing that you're going to write about, um, it helps to imagine that you're someone totally different and that you're not the person who wrote the story and kind of put yourself into that frame of mind and then read the story from that perspective. Do you think you can do that? Yeah? It's kind of hard. I try to do that. I try to think, you know, I'll sleep. I'll sleep on it, and then I'll come back and read a story, and I think, yeah, I know I wrote this. <laughs> so it's a hard thing to do, but if you can kind of put a little bit of distance between yourself and the story and read it, um, you can catch some mistakes that you made or you maybe will have some different ideas on ways that you can make the story more interesting or um, make it shorter, maybe. What's the point in making a story shorter? It gives more important facts and less details. Okay. Or de less details and more important facts. Right. Okay. Gets right to the point. Yeah, so the shorter you make something, the higher you start cutting up here. So you start cutting details to the point where you just get these big things. So depending on how much time you actually have, uh, it's unfortunate, but in today's world, most people really only read headlines. There have actually been studies about this. Isn't that sad? Yeah. What's the problem with reading just a headline? You missed everything. That's what the story was about. Yeah. You're getting, you're getting just like the very, very tip, and you have, you have no context to it, or you don't have any of the details that determine like what makes up that thing, or any understanding of maybe why, or any of the influencing factors that cause this thing to happen, the only thing you know is one sentence. And it's really hard, even for people who write as professionals every day, 
it's very hard to come up with one sentence or a part of a sentence that completely encapsulates a thing that might be really complicated that happened. Um, but depending on how much time you have, um, most audiences today, and I'm sure Randy probably talked about this with video, but people have an attention span of about two minutes with a video. So, I told him three, but that's close. <laughs> yeah. So the Facebook people, like eight minutes ago, stopped watching. If this is like, it's not live. Being, okay, it's not live. But they, trust me, will have stopped watching after two minutes. Um, so in writing, the, the equivalent of that in writing is probably about huh, four paragraphs. So the shorter you make something, typically the broader audience you can have for it, the more details you add and the farther you kind of go down in the uh, inverted pyramid, which just means upside down pyramid, uh, the, few, the fewer people you'll find who are actually willing to stick with a story for that long. So what are some things that might determine how long your written story is? Like, who is your audience? So if you're writing about this meeting where Mr. Henry rode off on the elephant, um, typically the, the audience for that would probably be, well, probably anybody, because it's pretty rare for some public official. Can you imagine? Can you imagine some like that really honestly happening? So that might end up in like the weird news section of something, you know? Um, but it, your audience sort of dictates how long you can make something. So if you have a group of scientists, for example, and you're writing about outer space, and that's what they do for a living, they're probably going to stick with you for a longer time for more details than like when, when I read a story about space. After the first few paragraphs, if things get really... Um, descriptive or there's a lot of terms that I don't understand, a lot of people kind of lose interest around here because you don't know all of those things. So depending on who your audience is, um, the most important thing with storytelling is that, um, and I would love to say that it's grammar and making sure that everything is correct, but that's just not it at all. The most important thing about telling a story is that if it's worth if it's worth telling, then the people should understand it. So above everything else, you should consider your audience and who you actually want to read and understand what you're writing. And that will determine if you're using words like uh, loquacious or lascivious or, uh, you know, these very... Um, higher level words when if you're talking to you know like a group of third graders um, they're two years below you so they might not know some vocabulary words that you do so you would have to kind of change what you say to make sure that they understand and in the same way if you're uh, writing a story for scientists you probably don't want to just get into things like uh, pop culture or you know, if the scientists were reading the story about Mr. Henry running off, like, on the, um, on the elephant, he might be inclined to understand how long the elephant has been domesticated and what kind of elephant it was and um, other details like that that the average reader doesn't even know, you know, a whole lot about elephants, so you will kind of lose them if you started going into all these details about elephants, even though elephants are super cool. So, uh, so what's the most important part of storytelling? Um, like the, I lost it. That people can actually understand what you're saying. That. Um, if you're going through all of this trouble to tell a story, don't worry about using big words unless your 
audience is looking for big words. And make sure that, that you're communicating your message because um, that's the point in storytelling is communicating. And uh, if you're not sort of tailoring what you say to an audience, then um, you're not doing the best job that you can to making sure that they actually read what you wrote and that the story is told or communicated. Okay, do you guys have any like specific questions about Emory? I rewrote this one, it was number one for um, this one right here, but <clears throat> tell me why you enjoy teaching and swimming. Would that be a good way to say it? For, for the interview part, yeah. yes. Yeah, I thought that your first question was what draws her to water? Well, let me, if you don't mind, I want to say something. I think we need to be able to separate in our mind what's going to be the written and what's going to be the video part. You're going to gather all your information for the written part in your interview part, right? Because that's the time you're going to talk to them. So, like what draws you into water, it's a good way to open up your paragraph for the exhibit writing. But even though you might not ask that question first, in video editing, we can chop up like we do writing. And that might be the answer. That might be how we open it. And I want to throw one thing out to you. Yeah, three minutes, two minutes, three minutes is probably people's interest. We might, you might ask 10 questions. And I'm not just throwing out something. We might only use bits of that. Remember how I said I only use parts, like sometimes parts of all the stuff I get? We might only use some of what they interview talks about. But the best way, if we can get your videos down to five minutes, the best way to do this is get the most interesting part right in the beginning that makes people want to wait to see how it finishes. So what draws you into water? And I'm just going to throw this out, is a great part for both the written and for the video set. Let's, let's just say, we don't know what your coach is going to say yet. Let's say, boy, I get splashed out every time I step on the, on to the sideline. Well, I don't know what they would call this by the pool. Then we might not, then we might cut what she might say next. And then she might go, but you know, I love getting wet. I love it. It has a feel for it. We might hold that part till the end of the video, and then someone can get to see the rest of the answer and makes them want to wait to see what the answer is. Okay, you follow that? Let's say your, your teacher from the coffee person says in the thing, I just like to sit back. I love a good sip of coffee. I love the smell of coffee. Well, then we might stop that in the video part and wait and see what they say later. They might say, I get a chance to finally have a cup of coffee at the end of the day, which would be a great finish for the, for the thing. Writing is basically getting all your stuff in the pyramid and then figuring out what is the best part. Am I close to what I'm talking about on that, Chris, with the writing part? I think so. Yeah, okay. get so, it in the pyramid and decide where it goes and then do it in that order. And I think we're both put together. I want you guys to know the written part that you're going to do, we're not going to have you write it until you've interviewed people. So you're going to be writing like while you're not here after the interview. But I'm assuming that by the beginning of November, I'm going to have all of you email me your written story. We'll be working on the video parallel, but remember the written part, which can be more than one paragraph, but we definitely don't want to make it more than four, right? Because that will be the interest, because it's going to go up next to your portrait that you take of them. Um, but what will happen is that will give us time, because if you email me the story, that I am going to forward it on to Chris, and she's been nice enough to Proof. Remember the proofreading part where it's good to have someone who's not connected or it's not, 
yourself doing it. She's going to be that person. And all she knows right now is your topic. She won't know anything more when she sees your story. And then she's going to send us up an edited proof, which you guys will look at one more time, and then I will print it up, and then we can go. So you follow what my game plan is. Okay. So when you're thinking of the questions for the video, you're also, at least when you're done with the interview, you're going to start thinking about how we're going to write this. So I'm really excited to read everybody's story. It sounds really, you have some really good ideas. Anthony? One question. When you're talking about the pyramid, do you just write, say if you got the, you can't think of the order that they should be in, but you know what you want. Do you just put it down and then you organize it later? Um, yeah. And what you could do is just when you start out to write your story is um, just, if you're not sure where it goes, just put a little list somewhere mm. and then maybe come back and think about it later and okay. you can figure out where it goes. Or you can say, well, if I'm having trouble deciding about this, does it really go in there? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you can Another idea, I'm sorry, I mean, just to let you know, is before you send me your written stories, yeah. pass them by somebody. Pass yeah. it by your mom, pass it by your dad, I, a friend, you know what I mean? just But not the person you interviewed. Yeah. Because they're going to think something else. So mm -hmm. pass it by someone, then send it to me, and then by the time Chris gets it, it's a second take, a second set of eyes. I know I'll be a second set of eyes, but I'm going to trust Chris... Because if you've ever seen his copy unedited, you would understand. It's a good thing he's sending it to me first. <laughs> yes. Yeah. He's pretty bad. It's cute, though. He's a camera person, you know. Um, so two things that I would like to mention before uh, heading out. Um, there are really two things that you can do to make yourself a better lifelong storyteller. You guys have any ideas what they might be? And these are things that anybody can do. Um, and by doing these things every day, it makes you a better storyteller. Write stuff down every day? Journal. Keep a diary. It doesn't have to be an official diary. But every day, especially on days when you have something really interesting happen, tell that story to your diary. Actually, um, you know, write in your diary about how it made you feel and what exactly happened. And remember that the next time you read this, you'll probably be an, an adult. So you put as many details in there as you can and um, make sure that um, that you're, you know, really clear and that you're making it uh, as interesting, but of course as true, because it's, it's your diary, uh, as interesting but as true as you can. And by doing that, you actually kind of start to form patterns in your head um, that, that start to kind of become your unique voice. Or does, do you guys know what a voice is in, in this context, like in this... So uh, there are lots of painters in the world, right? But you know when you look at a Picasso that it's a Picasso because Picasso has a very uh, unique style of doing things. And then there's this other Spanish artist named Juan Miro who, like everything he did, had these big lines and balls on them. And even though both of those men were Spanish painters and they were men, their work was totally different. Yeah, yeah. They each had a different way of expressing themselves. And the same thing is true when you're a writer. You have a different voice. Your voice sounds different. Uh, Emery, yours will be different from Anthony's, and Anthony's will be different from Brennan's. And the reason for that is that just like our voice that we have, the one that I'm using right now a lot, um, your voice sounds different. And so does yours, because this is just my voice. And yours is, is as unique to you as mine is 
or, you know, they're all unique. Um, and so when you actually write a diary and you write things down and you start to think about how you're going to form sentences and, uh, you know, even just explaining to your diary what happened to your, during your day, um, you're starting to use that muscle. And the more you use that muscle, the stronger it gets and the better storyteller you become. Uh, the second thing is read. And so just like you're, by keeping a journal, you start to kind of find your own voice. Uh, when you read, you get to hear the voices of other people, some of whom are better singers, meaning um, when you're reading things that are written by other people, you can see how what their voice is like and what kinds of words they used and what kind of rhythm they used in their writing and how they chose to describe things and what things they decided to put at the top of the pyramid. And then that gives you ideas about what you can do in your work. So you're kind of always influenced by the authors that you read or uh, even when you watch television and let's say you have a, fav a favorite uh, actor or movie uh, director, you, um, you get to know what that person's style is. And then if you were to go try to direct a movie, you would probably, uh, do you guys know what the word emulate means? You would probably kind of try to copy that person to some degree. And that's just another step in being a storyteller is to some degree uh, trying out other people's styles until you finally find On your, plate, your, your style. own voice. Exactly. Yeah. So, well, this is fun. I'm really looking forward to reading your stories and uh, hopefully Red Fingernails <laughs> won't, won't be in there. Uh, but, oh, it's pink. Oh, pink. Okay. See? Chris, um, thank you very much. You're welcome. Remember how she said in the, in the diary? Long. It doesn't have to be long, but every day, and not only will it help you as a writer, it will also help you as a visual storyteller. And when she talked about putting in the details, that's equal to her saying, show me. Yeah, show me. All right. Well, thank you, guys. I'm looking forward to reading your stories.